today let me tell you the story of Samuel, the only man in all of scripture who is both a judge and a prophet. He begins a life, his mother dedicated him to the service of God, and so as a young boy he was dropped off at Shiloh to be raised by the priests there, Eli. Shiloh is where all the nation of Israel gathered to, to, to worship and to make sacrifices. And when he was young, something happens to him, this is probably the best known story that, we, that most people know of him. When he was young, he heard a voice calling for him while he was asleep. And he woke up, and he went to uh, see Eli. He thought it was Eli, the priest, who was the guy, sort of father figure, uh, who was calling for him. And Eli said, go back to bed. And it happens again. Someone calls out for him, and he goes, and he goes to Eli and says, Eli, what do you need? And, and or Eli goes, seriously, just, just go to sleep. The third time it happens, Eli, uh, probably realizing that he's not going to be getting any sleep, wakes up and, and explains and realizes what's happening. And he says to him, this, uh, this might be God trying to get your attention. So next time someone says your name, say, say here I am, Lord. Um, and, and that's what happens. And, and uh, Samuel says this, here I am. And he hears this message from God. We could stop right there with the life and times of Samuel and talk about the importance of mentors in the faith and having mentors who can help us hear and help us understand what we're listening to. But, you know, there's so much more story to unfold, and it's so interesting. So let's, uh, let's keep on moving. Because what happens is Samuel is told by God that uh, Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, well, they're goners. They're doomed. You see, Eli, good upright man, had raised two sons that did not follow in his footsteps. And, and these are uh, uh, Hophni and Phinehas. They are, are priests as well at Shiloh, and as people come to make their offering, to make their sacrifice, the priests would get a portion of that. They would get the leftovers, basically. You give the best cut, the, 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 the first fruit, the best cut of meat to God, and then uh, the priests would take the leftovers because they got to have something to eat. And, and Hophni and Phinehas, they were tired of having the last portion. They wanted the, the, the really the best cut. They wanted the first stuff offered. And so the people would show up with something to sacrifice, to offer to God. These two priests would tell them, you've got to give us the best. And the people would say, but that's God's. And they would say, too bad. And so uh, they're bums. They're, they're taking what's God's, and, and Samuel hears the judgment upon them. A nice little lesson right there we could stop and look at. Don't take what's God's. Hophni and Phinehas are, are doomed because they've been doing it. But uh, the story is still unfolding, right? The, the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes that make up Israel, without consulting the priests, without a prayer, literally just because they feel like they, they need to, they decide that they want to go and fight the Philistines. The Philistines are um, the neighboring uh, sort of tribes, and they're always raiding, always causing problems, always trying to take cattle, the whole nine yards. I don't think they had cattle. Did they have cattle? Sheep, livestock? They're always causing problems. And uh, so the 12 tribes, they get together and they say, we're going to go fight the Philistines. It's, it's time to go fight the Philistines. And so they go down to fight the Philistines, and they get whooped. They just get clobbered. And so they go home, tail between their legs, and they think to themselves, we need to do better than this. Aha! Let's get our secret weapon. And what is the secret weapon of the Jewish people? Let's go get the Ark. right? Let's go get the Ark, because the Ark of the Covenant has the two tablets, the Ten Commandments on it, and, and you carry the Ark because to, 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 that's how God is with you, and God is right there in, in the Ark. And so they figure, well, let's go get the Ark, and we'll take the Ark into battle with us, because we take the Ark into battle, we can't lose. And they go to uh, Hophni and Phinehas, these two bums of priests, and they don't see any problem with this plan either, and so they uh, they just go, uh, they just go and, and they fight uh, the Philistines. And, and it's a shame we don't know what Eli says about this. Eli has been steamrolled by his sons. He tried to correct them before, and they'd ignored him. And he probably tries to correct them this time, and he, they ignore him. And so they go down to fight the Philistines, and they take the ark with them, Hophni, Phineas, the armies of Israel, and the ark, and they get clobbered. They just get creamed, right? They just get completely massacred. The uh, Hophni and Phineas both die, and uh, the runner goes back to tell Eli, and as soon as Eli finds this out, he falls off his chair in shock and breaks his neck and dies. This is a sad end for, for him. And, uh, and the Philistines, they capture the ark. And so they're excited because they've caught, they, they have captured the secret weapon, 
that isn't so secret and, and wasn't that good of a weapon, but still they have it, and it's gold, and they might as well hold on to it. It's very cool. So they have it, they take, take the ark home. The problem is, everywhere they put the ark, the people around them, around who are living the area, start to get sick. Start to have pr problems with plagues and tumors and rats and all that. And so uh, they figure, this is not working for us. Let's send this back where it belongs. Let's put the ark on a cart pulled by some oxen and we'll let it go. And if it goes back to Israel, we'll know that that's where it belongs. And, and just to make sure that, they un that uh, the God of Israel understands that they're serious in their apology, they put on the, with the, on the cart, uh, with the ark, they put on uh, five golden tumors and five gold rats which would be odd. I, I, I can imagine what a gold rat would look like. I'm not quite sure what a gold tumor would look like. But the point is, they put this like offering, this gold, on the cart, and they send it back, and, and the cart goes straight back to Israel, and they say, well, thank God, poof, done with that problem. And uh, the ark gets into Israel, and everyone knows what it looks like, right? And so the, some people of Israel, some Jews, see it coming, and they're excited, because they've never seen it in person before. And they go and they open up the ark to look inside, and they die. Turns out Indiana Jones and the whole lost Indiana Jones. What is it? Indiana. Indiana Jones and the is that Crusaders of the Lost? Raiders. Darn it. My parents can testify to the fact I've never been able to quote movies, and now evidently I can't even get the titles right either. The point being, at the end of that Indiana Jones movie where they open up the ark and everyone melts, that's biblically, that's biblically support. Well, the whole melting thing, that's not actually in the Bible. It just says they die. The whole melt, melting is probably artistic license. But again, a good lesson from the life and times of Samuel. If you find the ark of the covenant, don't open it. Bad idea. So uh, Samuel gathers the tribes together after this. They've learned their lesson. He invites them to turn back to God, and they do so. And, and as they're turning back to God, uh, they hear that the Philistines are invading again. And this time, they've learned their lesson. And uh, they pray. They have Samuel pray for us. And they went out to get ready for battle. And uh, it says that the voice of the Lord thundered against them. And uh, what I'm guessing probably happened, if you were there to watch, was that as the Philistine and the Jewish army came together, that a thunderstorm probably broke out right on top of the Philistines. And uh, carrying heavy armor and swords is probably hard enough. Trying to do it while wet is, is harder. Trying to do it while wet and there's a thunderstorm going on over your head and not over the other army, yeah, I'd run too. So uh, they have a bad day, and they again they, they learn this is the next one of those lessons from uh, life and times of Samuel. Always pray before start starting something; it works out better. And, and so this begins the time where uh, Samuel he replaces Eli. He's now going to be the judge over Israel, and he rides this circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah. And then he goes home to Ramah, and then he'll go out and ride this circuit again and again, dealing with the problems that come up. And as he rides this circuit, I'm not going to say he's the first circuit rider. I, I, I'm not going to say he's Methodist, but isn't it interesting? First dude I know of to ride a circuit. And uh, we can, again, stop the story here. Samuel has hit the high, place, high point of his life. Everything is great. He is a judge over Israel. Israel is safe. Israel is sound. The people have turned back to, to God. But that's not the end of the story, really, is it? The story keeps on going. It keeps on unfolding. And we, as we turn the page, we find out that Samuel does that thing that all of us do eventually. He grows old. He grows old and he has two sons and he's going to send these two sons out to ride that circuit from uh, Gilgal to Mitzpah and, and Bethel. And he sends out these two sons named Joel and Abijah. And well, let's just say they're not the men that their father was. As you look across scripture, I can't think of a single time where a son measures up to the father. Uh, if you look at, uh, there's an earlier judge, Gideon, his son Abimelech is a bum. Eli, he has two sons, they're bums. And now Samuel has two sons, and they're bums. It, maybe I'm wrong, if you can think of a time when a son is as good a man as the father in Scripture, please tell me, because otherwise it's just kind of a, huh, it's not a good record. But it, it's, an, it's a sad thing to say, though, because you think of Samuel, the reason he is the judge and the leader over Israel is because Eli who was a great man, had two sons that turned into bums. And so Samuel sort of takes those two sons' place. 
And, and Samuel has been raised by Eli, and Samuel has been mentored by Eli, and, and so you think Samuel would have learned the lessons of Eli. And evidently he learned one lesson he should not have learned. He uh, did, learned how to raise sons just like Eli. And so he has these two sons who do not accept correction, who take bribes, and uh, he repeats the mistakes of his mentor. It, so it might be that we need to modify that first lesson uh, of the life and times of Samuel. Everyone needs a mentor, but no mentor is perfect. Right? No mentor is perfect. So the tribes send their leaders to Samuel and to tell, tell him that this isn't going to fly, your sons, and, and we need a king. And Samuel tells them, if you have a king, he's going to take your sons to man his armies. He's going to take your daughters to bake his bread. He's going to take your grain, your male and female slaves, a tenth of your flock, and you're going to cry out to God, and God's going to say, tough noogies, this is what you asked for. That's my translation. Uh, but that's what you're going to hear. And they say, we want a king anyways. And so Samuel appoints a king. The first king of Israel, Saul. Now, Saul is a tough cookie, because it's hard to understand Saul. He is exactly the king you'd expect. He, he's a tall, uh, muscular, great warrior. And so is the lesson that uh, the people you expect to be great don't always pan out because Saul turns into uh, a self-centered leader more worried about appearances than a, what's truly important. So is the lesson that you shouldn't judge people by appearances. Or is the lesson that uh, God chooses a, a king out of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe. And so you don't, you don't know where leaders come out of unexpected places. I, I don't know. I don't understand, really, Saul. But either way, Samuel has appointed Saul as king. And he does something that can't have been easy. He goes from being the last judge of Israel, and he becomes the first prophet of Israel. He changes gear. He changes tasks. He starts doing very, something very different, so that when Saul goes astray, he shows up to confront him. And this begins the, the cycle that will happen again and again and again throughout these following books of Scripture. That when a, a king goes astray, it's a prophet who will show up to correct them. That, that's the continued pattern here we see in Scripture. Another nice little lesson we could take from this then is that Samuel, uh, as the times change, he changes with them. And, and so, so should we. Right? So after... Uh, Samuel appoints Saul as a king, and he doesn't work out. Uh, he starts to mope because, well, he'd appointed him as a king, and it didn't work out. He was, he was moping, and God tells him, stop moping. You've got to go appoint a new king, David. He appoints David, and then he, he kind of disappears from public life until this very odd event when King Saul goes to the witch of Endor and uh, asked to, to, for the witch of Endor to raise the spirit of Samuel, and the spirit of Samuel shows up and tells uh, Saul, you're still doomed. It, it, it's a very odd moment. But uh, that's kind of the end of the life and times of Samuel. And we, we could take the entirety of this story, and we could cherry pick pieces of it, and we could make him look amazing. We could make Samuel look like one of the most important people in Scripture, the person who guided Israel out of the wild west of the judges and sets Israel up for the golden age of King David. We could also flip it around, pick different verses, and talk about how Samuel is a complete and utter failure. He takes the system of, being, of Israel being led by judges, and he just completely destroys it because his king, his sons are such bums and he should have known better since Eli's sons were such bums and he should have learned his lesson and he just sets it up with this monarchy that never really pans out. You could take either way of approaching the life of Samuel either as the most amazing person in scripture or as this utter bum and they would both be wrong because Samuel he's not as simple as saying he was a great hero or he was a, a guy who had problems and couldn't do a good job raising his family his life is more complicated than that, right? I mean, you can take out individual lessons, the importance of having mentors, pray before starting something, please don't open the ark, times change. You could take these individual lessons, but even then you're not getting the entirety, the complexity of his life, right? He was a complicated guy who had great moments of faith, standing up to the first king of Israel, but he couldn't discipline his own children so that they turned out worth a lick. Right? This is a guy who cannot be reduced to one simple Sunday school story. His, he has a complicated life, and, and that's just how life is, isn't it? I, I think our lives are similarly complex, just like Samuel. Each one of us is an amazing mix of faith and doubt, strength and struggle. 
just like Samuel. Yet we, we respect him and we are graceful to him. We don't look down on him and, and kick him out of the Bible because he has some problems. And, and hopefully we can do that with ourselves as well. Some of us are a little bit hard on ourselves. Some of us are, are beat ourselves up because we're less than perfect. We, we beat ourselves up because we're not always consistent and coherent, always faithful to, and always Christ-like. You know, we're not. And neither was Samuel. And still, he's still a great hero of Scripture. And so I think maybe one lesson, bigger lesson to take from the life and times of Samuel is that uh, be graceful with yourself. Let yourself be less than perfect. Also, we are all, also called to be graceful in this same way with others. Right? How, if we're going to be graceful in this way with, with Samuel, can we be graceful in the same way with others? I, I was thinking of Samuel this week. I was hearing on uh, the news that Martin Luther King Jr., who we're celebrating tomorrow, right? His three sons are suing each other right now. Who, who, have you all heard about this? Who's suing? Is this common? Yeah, they're suing each other right now. Their three sons, two of them are suing the third because they want to sell the Bible uh, and the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I don't particularly care whether Martin Luther King Jr.'s Bible and Peace Prize are sold, but it bothers me deeply that the man who spent his life leading towards reconciliation, towards the kingdom of God, towards bringing people together in the name of Jesus Christ, raised three children that are now suing each other. Isn't that depressing? Right? And does it, now, does that mean that tomorrow we're not going to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.? No, it just means that his life was complicated. As a young man raising a family, he had to travel a lot. Well, so did Samuel. Or Mitzpah to Gilgal to Bethel and all that traveling. Maybe he wasn't there enough for his kids. Maybe Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't there enough for his kids. Maybe life is complicated and we don't stop celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. We just acknowledge. Complicated. right? We give him the grace to allow him to be something less than perfect. And then maybe we could also strive to do that with each other. As you look around the church, and go, go ahead, look around. Each one of you here is far more than you, you could each imagine in some ways, and in other ways far less. You are each complicated and beautiful and wonderful and broken. You are each complicated. right? If you think you understand someone and they're simple, you're wrong. You just haven't drank enough coffee with them yet. Everyone is complicated. Let them be. Give them the grace to allow them to be something less than you expect, but also something far more. My friends, I have no simple take-home for you today. I have no simple lesson, because as we look at the entirety of the life and times of Samuel, it's complicated, right? There's a lot going on. There are high points, there are low points, there are great achievements, and there are huge mistakes. Right? Life is complicated. He was complicated. We are complicated. Sometimes that's the best we can do. Give people the grace to be complicated. Well, actually, there is one simple thing I can tell you. Of all the lessons today, I can tell you one simple, direct, very straightforward lesson. Try, hold on to this. If you ever find yourself looking at the Ark of the Covenant, don't open it. Your face will melt off. Amen.